Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be in this lovely city today and I must thank the organizers of the uh, panel for having me on board. I'm currently working on a research project about the consumption of uh, Athenian pottery in the Iberian Peninsula, but for today's talk I'll go back to an old piece of uh, research of mine that might be more relevant for the presentation because it <coughs> provides a commentary on the interpretation of art objects from archaeological excavations as well as uh, on the role of iconography in processes of identity formation and the pervasive nature of images in the uh, modern process of a scholarly interpretation of the archaeological uh, or of the past, actually. So my case study is the uh, an attic shape known as the Plemohoi. So this is a stemmed vessel, black glazed and most often lidded, whose essential characteristic is the incurving rim that you see here overhanging, uh, where is the, uh, here, overhanging on the uh, interior. Its function is not entirely clear and its peculiar rim considerably limits the functions and the uses that it can perform. It's neither a drinking nor a pouring vessel, but it looks like a perfect container to hold kind of powderish product or even liquids uh, which could be sprinkled with the fingers, but which at the same time are not too precious. So we rule out uh, pure perfume and exotic oils because these are much more conveniently stored in narrow necked containers such as the uh, alabastron or the lekithos. Uh, but what's interesting about the Blemohoe is that uh, it's a seemingly divide existent between how it is represented on vase painting, we have it here and here, um, versus the evidence of its actual use provided by the extant vessels. Uh, the Plemohoe is one of the vessels that most often appears in the realm of women in Attic vase painting, particularly in the second half of the 5th century, and it has traditionally been assumed that its use was restricted to them, to women. Also, because of the association of the vessel with the feminine world in vase painting, when it appears in the archaeological record uh, in late 6th century and 5th century Macedonian and Boeotian tombs, the vase is taken as a gender marker and the deceased is assumed to be a woman. So the two sources of evidence for uh, my research are the archaeological artifact itself and its images on other vases. Scholars often use vase painting to make sense of the archaeological record and that's fine, but that often leads to distortions of the evidence to fit the discourse provided by the uh, images. And this is particularly dangerous in cases uh, like ours, when the two types of evidence come from two uh, different cultural milieu and temporary milieu, chronological uh, milieu. So we cannot use an Athenian image to explain the use of a given shape among the Macedonians or the Boeotians in this case. So, um, the extant Plemohoe come mainly from, uh, let's say, Macedonian and Boeotian tombs, where they should be put into relation to a wider class of uh, vases with this uh, sort of uh, kind of inward dreams. Um, and the Plemohoe, uh, which are very often represented on Athenian vases, are surprisingly very seldom attested in Attica. There's a couple of them, and this one comes from the uh, tumulus of Marathon. This is a list of sites uh, which have yielded Exalytra and Plemohoe in uh, ancient Macedonia. By Exalytra, I mean the um, Corinthian or local version of the um, Athenian shape of the Plemohoe. The Exalytra, as I say, local and Corinthian, are very, uh, a very important uh, phenomenon in the Thermaic uh, Gulf, this area, where um, they were an essential part of the basic funerary set. And Vivisari Panidi, we'll come back to the uh, other slide, explains its popularity as a result of a particular need for the shape derived from its suitability for the storage of uh, local specific uh, products, such as the nitrum calastricum, which was a compound of great importance in the preparation of different salves and pharmaceutical formulations, and which was particularly important among the uh, Macedonians and in the burial customs of the Macedonians. 
As for the Plemohoe, although in absolute terms they are a remarkable con there's a remarkable concentration of them in Macedonia, relatively speaking, they are just a very restricted phenomenon and they appear uh, only very sporadically there. We have some 20 examples. They appear in well-furnished graves in some of the wealthiest cemeteries of the region, um, what suggests that they could have been deemed prestigious in that context, in those contexts. Nevertheless, their insignificant number does not make it possible to establish a direct and definite link between the particular level of the wealth at the tomb and the consumption of the shape. Because we have many wealthy burials uh, which do not have plemohoe, and the deposition of the examples that we have uh, is far from following uh, a recognizable pattern. Uh, so the archaeological record suggests um, both uh, the same function for both the exalitron and the plemohoe, um, but there's uh, maybe a slightly different function. And it can be noted also that the presence of one shape most often uh, excludes the other, and that there's no accumulation of shapes that could be understood to perform the same use. And finally, the presence of the plemohoe in the cemeteries that I studied did not distinguish between genders either, which is quite important. Um, and at least for the graves which, uh, for which we count with osteological studies, these are not all of them, of course, but we have reliable data for many. The situation uh, differs somehow in the ocean. From the 41 tombs that fall within the chronology of my shape in the cemetery of Ritsona, uh, 19 did not contain either Plemohoe or Exalitra, and most of these had less than 100 objects in uh, total. The name that what you see here, Cothonis, um, well, it's another name for the Exalitra, so I, I mean uh, Exalitra. Um, the remaining 22 burials in Arizona have Plemo Exalitra, and nine of them also include Plemohoe. So that means that none of the graves without Exalitra had Plemohoe, but the other situation is attested. Also, as you see in the table, the ratio between the two vessels is interesting. The higher number of Exalitra, the higher number of Plemohoe, but the Exalitra are always more common than the uh, Plemohoe. The Plemohoe concentrate in the best provisioned tombs, um, those that received more than 200 objects, while the Exalitra, although present there, um, they appear in more modest tombs, uh, so to say, uh, well, modest for the Ritzona standards, of course, tombs that contain less than 100 objects. So the number of Plemohoe that a particular disease received was then clearly dependent on the total number of objects disposed for uh, them. But contrary to the situation of Macedonia, neither the Plemohoe nor the Exalitron were part of the basic set of uh, grave goods uh, at Rizona. This basic set there was made up of at least one oil uh, container, closed, uh, closed oil container, um, usually the lekythos and a drinking vessel, which was usually the cantharos. So if we exclude a practical function for the plemohoe in Ritsona, evidence points again towards the idea of wealth, um, which in this case is not expressed by the introduction of the Athenian shape uh, uh, at the expense of the Salipstron, <coughs> but by the massive accumulation of objects of all sorts. So also the burials which contained plemohoe there had metal objects, glass figurines, etc., and even silver, uh, silver necklace. So let's have now a look at the second part of the material. There's only a few representations of the shape on black figure vases starting at the, uh, the end of the sixth century, but red figure vase painting and white crown lekithoi offer much uh, more material to study um, the shape. The scenes with Plemohoe can be divided roughly in three groups. First, we have images where we can assume that the vase is uh, actually being used or is going to be used soon. These, as you see here, are mainly bath scenes and active beautification scenes, like also these ones. 
Uh, these images offer a background against which to understand the second group of images, which are images where these and other objects are being uh, presented to a woman in a more or less defined setting, uh, generally in bridal scenes or in more uh, passive beautification scenes like this one uh, here. So the object is exchanged and displayed together with other shapes such as the alabastron or the uh, mirror, uh, other kinds of uh, boxes. This group points to the wedding of one, as one of the contexts where the vessel would acquire relevance because this is a moment where the cleansing of the body and the attractiveness of the bride are important. At the same time, within this iconographical tradition, these images uh, help us understand, and also this one helps us understand many of the scenes in the first group as invested of uh, uh, bridal nuances, um, very broadly speaking, of course. The third category of images um, uh, also uh, takes to the limits the observations just made about the second group, because these are mainly late images, 4th century vases, where the plebohoe uh, and other boxes and objects uh, become the focal centers of attention of the uh, scene because of their magnified dimensions, as you see here. So uh, the object here becomes a sort of extension of the woman's own, a woman's own body. Um, but I think the presence of these bars and others in these scenes is not random and meaningless. And from, judging from all these images, I think that Plemohoe was used in general um, <coughs> terms to recall the nuptial bath, and as it is the case with other objects such as the calathos or the alabastrum, it brings forth a series of ideas, or ideals better, about the contemporary Athenian woman. But from these, it doesn't follow that the use of the vase was restricted to women exclusively. So in this line, uh, we need to address also the scenes on the uh, lekithoi. So the fact that it's women uh, who bring the vase to the tomb on Athenian white ground lekithoi of the second half of the 5th century uh, does not say anything about the gender of the deceased and is definitely no evidence to argue that the 6th century Boeotian and Macedonian tombs where the vase appears uh, are female burials. And even if we want to take the lekithoi at face value, the claim does not find support, because on the occasions where the dead is actually present, this is most often uh, a male, uh, not, not a woman. So also, um, it's also, wor also worth noting that the, uh, what we are seeing on the lekithoi are grave offerings, which in purpose are not the same as grave goods. So that might, might or may not explain the absence of the shape from contemporary Athenian graves. And also relevant uh, is the absence of figural decoration of the plemohoi. Many a priori gendered objects, such as the eutrophery, peanut drop, pixidias, etc., seem to target their potential users by the, by, by the display of a particular iconography. Um, and if the gender dimension were so important in the case of the Plemohoe, one might, may wonder, of course, why they did not receive images at all. So uh, this is only a quick, uh, very quick overview of the theme. You can find more information in uh, this publication. Uh, um, but I hope to have showed the dangers of a too positivistic comparison between life and art. So the Plemohoe was, broadly speaking, a cosmetics container indeed. But this function does not necessarily put it exclusively in the realm of women, because there are many occasions in the ancient world where cosmetics were used. So the vase painting shows a remarkable association of the vase and women, and that derives in highly iconic images where the object and woman become one, and the object is invested with gender connotations that must be explored, of course. So, um, it's integrated in a cosmos of objects that function as metonymies of a series of values uh, and characteristics that define the reputed Athenian woman of the time, but this is only one of its uses. The gender connotations that we can observe in part of the images of the vase do not translate to the archaeological record, 
And in fact, if I had to generalize about anything, uh, about the Athenian Plemohoi as indicator of anything in the archaeological record, record, it would not be gender, but a certain degree of wealth, although we must be extra cautious uh, here also. In sum, uh, the Plemohoi is just a restricted phenomenon and very interesting phenomenon that allows us to test some of all traditional assumptions between the relation, uh, on the relationship between art and life, and it contributes to the fundamental question of how to understand Greek imagery, and it shows once more the importance of the context for the interpretation of the remains of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you.